You know, we've been together for a few weeks now talking about this idea of preparing our hearts and our minds for the future, the plans and the purposes that God has in store for us. And, you know, a bit of an anchor for us for this whole year is, is going to be, you know, the 23rd Psalm. But, you know, right now we're looking at the story of Elijah and the reality of who Elijah was, really a nobody from nowhere, who was God's mouthpiece in a season where there was one of the most evilest kings there ever was, Ahab. And we know that, that God is using him. So God tells Elijah to tell them there's going to be no rain until God says so. And so for you know, six plus years, there's no rain. And you know, God takes Elijah and he puts him in the Karif Ravine and the birds feed him. And then you know, God tells Elijah to go like, into the enemy's camp. So it's Ahab's father-in-law's city. And there's a widow there that's going to care for him. And while Elijah's there, God does the miracle. You remember from last week, and if you don't, you could watch it. Um, you know, like God makes the jar of bread and oil keep going and not running out, and they eat. And then, you know, then God uses him to teach him a lesson about, you know, like big problems require big prayer, and big prayer provides big provision. And again, you see a theme in the this story of Elijah, that God is always using the circumstances that Elijah finds himself in to prepare him for what's next, to make him fit for the future. And again, it's this, you know, like there's a lot of climbing of, you know, metaphorical mountains and then down into deep valleys, but all of this trekking that he's doing, whether they're physical <laughs> Karif ravines or metaphorical places of, of great, you know, like amazing miracles then back down to like well what's happening why is this happening you know like these these uh emotional and spiritual gymnastics that is doing in the moment are preparing for something and if you look at it through sort of fresh eyes at the story even if you go you know into the next season uh first kings chapter 18 you notice that there's this season that he's going to be in next that requires some meaningfully and powerful prayers to move the hand of God. Well, he just experienced what it looks like and his ability to put his trust and faith in God's provision and move the hand of God because he raised the boy back to life. And we find ourselves in these situations all the time where we don't really understand that there is a lot of power in our prayers, especially the prayer of faith. In James chapter 5, verse 16 it says, therefore, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous man or a man in right standing or a woman in right standing, right, is powerful and effective. So if you could, if you read that and you take it in the context of what we've been learning, you know, because we look at, you know, one verse later, James chapter 16, 5, 16 we see it say Elijah was a man just like us and he prayed earnestly, right? And he prayed earnestly and it didn't rain for six years. When we look at the life of Elijah, we have to learn about the importance of praying these powerful prayers. That you and I, the men and women of God, have the ability to ask God to do the impossible in the name of Jesus. You can go all the way back to you know, Psalm 23, when it says that he leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake, that God's going to take you into spaces and places where you're going to have the ability to, for the namesake of Jesus, perform the miraculous through the power of prayer. And that might be the restoration of your family. That might be literal physical miracles to heal the sick. Right. That might be that whatever it is that you're praying over people and that God's going to do it. But there's this power in our prayer. And the more that we pray these big prayers, the more that God does powerful things in and through us. In fact, if you look at Kings, first Kings, chapter 18, it says, after many days, the word of the Lord came to Elijah in the third year, saying, go show yourself to Ahab. And tell him that I'll send rain upon the earth. So Elijah went to show himself to Ahab. And by faith, Ahab called him to a place, um, right? Now, oh, excuse me. And he went and showed himself to Ahab. And so it was this idea of this being obedient. Remember, he, he went and said, hey, there's not going to be any rain. And then he says, now go and tell Ahab there will be rain. Um, and I'm going to send it. So Elijah went and went to show himself. Sometimes God calls you to do things that you don't completely understand. 
right? And so in keeping with this idea of being obedient, I mean, it's not just Elijah. You can go back to Abraham. And in Hebrews chapter 11, we find out that Abraham, right, by faith, went to where he was called, that he would later receive his inheritance, and he obeyed it, and he went, even though he did not know where he was going. We don't always know what God's going to do. That's why faith... Um, has to be linked with obedience when it comes to these powerful prayers. Like, and sometimes we don't have enough faith, so we borrow the faith of others. But sometimes our faith is just stepping out into the unknown, even though we don't know what God's going to do next. Maybe we've seen him do it in the past, but we've already forgotten what he's done before. The prayer of faith is about like the ability to be so in tune to listening to God's voice that sometimes you even hear the inaudible. Now, mind you, we're in a place in space right now where, um, you know, Elijah has already, you know, like performed these miracles. And now he says to, uh, Elijah says to Ahab, go and get something to eat and drink for I hear a mighty rainstorm coming. There's not a cloud in the sky. And yet he says, I hear a mighty rainstorm coming. Well, he's speaking prophetically. He's so used to, at this point, trusting God's provision that God guides me and asks me to do something, then God's going to see it all the way through. And so the frequency in which you practice listening to the voice of God, or that still small voice as we often call it, gives you the ability to speak on God's behalf and to speak these big prayers into existence. Sometimes we just don't listen to God's voice enough, and most of the time it's probably because there's so much other noise in our lives that's drowning out the voice of God. These powerful prayers are about obedience, and they're also about the ability through practice Right? We're getting fit for the future. We're practicing. We're living out what we're learning of hearing God's voice and listening to God's voice. And, you know, like the powerful prayer of a righteous man, this faithful prayer of a, of a righteous woman accomplishes the impossible. So Ahab went off to eat and drink, but Elijah climbed to the top of Mount Carmel. He bent down to the ground and he put his face between his knees. Look at his posture. I mean, Elijah's already performed significant miracles in the name of God. Eli Elijah's already had an experience where, you know, he's done dynamic things in the power and the presence of God, in the name of God, for the people, and yet he still understands the posture of prayer. He puts his head between his knees and he faces the ground. Again, go all the way back to the 23rd Psalm. The Lord, capital L-O-R-D, right? Yahweh, the great creator, is my shepherd. God is big, I am small, and somehow he still uses me to bring hope to the world one person at a time. It's humbling. It's significant. And so he postures in such a way where he makes himself small because his God is big. I'm not the one doing it. It's God doing it. I'm just the vessel he's using in this moment. Keep reading in verse 43. He says to his servant, go and look towards the sea. And he went up and he looked and he says, there's nothing there. And so as he prays with his head between his knees, he says again seven different times, Elijah says, go back and check again. Notice that his prayer isn't a one and done, that his prayer is, it's ridiculous prayer. His prayer is, it's a powerful prayer, but it's a ridiculous prayer that I just told the king who wants to kill me that it's going to rain and the drought's going to be over. And if, if I don't come through, there's going to be problems. God, where are you? And so he puts his head between his knees and he tells his servant to go check and seven different times as he prays, he doesn't give up. My encouragement to you from this story is to not give up. This is a very similar story to Joshua in the battle of Jericho, right? Seven times around. What if they would have given up on five, six, three, two? 
This is ridiculous. Why are we doing this? Sometimes God requires our humble obedience in the face of the ridiculous and the impossible so that he can only prove without the shadow of a doubt that he is truly God. Verse 44, on the seventh time the servant reported, a cloud as small as a man's hand is rising from the sea. Could you imagine being that servant? Seven times you've ran from the mountain to the edge to see if there's anything there, and seven times you've come back, and finally you go, I mean, there's a cloud, but like, it's, it's a baby cloud. I mean, I can, it, it's little. I mean, I can block it out with one hand. That's how little it is. And you think that's going to have enough rain to end this drought, this multi-year drought? So Elijah says, go and tell Ahab, hitch up your chariot and go down before the rain stops you. He says, that little cloud is going to rain so hard that if you don't get out of here now, you're going to get stuck in the mud. Sometime God gives you a very small sign. And if you're not careful, that small sign, we can dismiss it. You're praying for rain. You're praying for God to do something big in your life. You're praying for healing and second chances and new beginnings and rest, restored families. You're praying for financial blessings and jobs and, and you know, love and, and future and hope for tomorrow. And God is at work in your life. And it's in these small little ways, little by little, this obedient, prayerful, humble stature, posture that God continues to do it through us. And in the still small, in an itty bitty, he shows up. And if you're not careful and you're not practiced at paying attention, you could miss out. What if, what if Elijah or the servant would have just been like, forget it, man. This is never going to happen. Meanwhile, the sky grew black, verse 45. The clouds and the wind rose, a heavy rain came on Ahab as he rode off to Jezreel. You know, you see this verse that God is finishing what he started. But it started with something like a sign of a cloud the size of a man's hand. It started with something like Elijah being willing to go and be obedient to what God told him to do. Go back and tell him it's going to rain now, finally. It started because God was going to complete what he said he was going to do, and it, and it happened because his servant Elijah was obedient and humble and faithful. And the journey, even up until this moment, is just a small part. It's just a small part in what God is actually doing through him. And again, I just I've read you these passages from James numerous times today. And I don't know why James is so fascinated with Elijah. But he says, right? Elijah was a man just like us. He prayed earnestly that it would not rain, and it did not rain on the land for 3 years. Again he prayed, and the heavens gave rain, and the earth produced crops. Elijah, a man just like us. Elijah, verse 16. The prayers of a righteous man are powerful and effective. Elijah's big prayers aren't powerful and effective because he's so righteous, but because he chose to remain in right standing. He kept in step with his creator. He allowed the good shepherd to lead him in good times and bad and in the bad times, he used those bad times to prepare him for what was going to be next. In the good times, he used those good times, those miracles, to strengthen his inner resolve to believe that God had done it in the before. God can do it again. The prayer of a righteous man, or a man or a woman in right standing with God, is the prayer of someone who's keeping in step with the Holy Spirit. What's the opposite of that? Well, someone who has allowed idols to block their view of God. Someone who's allowed their missing of the signs allow them to get off track and get lost. But the beautiful thing is that God will always bring you back 
and let you start again, a God of second chances and new beginnings. I believe that God's going to do something big through you this year. I believe that God's going to use you to bring healing and restoration. I believe God's going to use you to lead others to still waters and green pastures because he's moving in you and through you. I believe God's going to use you to perform the miraculous, just like Elijah. I believe God's going to use you to be the provision of the bread and the oil, just like the widow. I believe God's going to use you to provide the meat and the bread, just like the ravens. I believe God's going to use you to speak truth to leaders who are evil, even when it's uncomfortable, just like Elijah. I believe God's going to use you to partner with others who are doing the will of God, like the servant, and to go time and time and time again, even a menial task that seems like you could be doing something more important. And yet without it, Elijah would have never known that there was a cloud the size of a man's hand. I believe God's going to use you in powerful movements of prayer to bring the living water that produces crops again into the community that you love. In this drought season of fear and forgetfulness, God's going to use your obedience, your faith, and your humble posture to bring life and sustenance to the people he's entrusted to you.